Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Nick Weiner with Octo Open Communications for the Ocean, filling in for Sarah Carr. Uh, with me co-hosting is Ray Everard and Sherry Wagner, and we're very pleased to have you all here today. Uh, so just a few notes quick about using GoToWebinar. So you'll notice in that probably top right-hand corner of your screen, there should be a little like orange red arrow that uh, opens and hides the GoToWebinar control <coughs> panel. Uh, you can pop that off to the side during the webinar so you don't have it up in your face. But if you open it up, uh, you'll notice that there is a questions panel within that box. If you have any questions for Fernando during the webinar, uh, make sure you just type them in there. All those questions will come into us on the back end, and we'll relay those questions to Fernando at the end of the webinar. Uh, if there's any short clarifying questions, I uh, will be sure to put those through during the webinar. Uh, so with that, uh, Sherry Wagner wanted to talk to you all about the Reef Resilience Network, so I will hand it off to her real quick. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Reef Resilience Network since we're co-sponsoring this webinar. Um, you can please take a look after the webinar at reefresilience.org. We've got case studies from all over the world, science and management strategies, and archived webinars like this one, and um, notices about upcoming webinars, and trainings, as well as an online forum. And that's it for me. Uh, with no further ado, we wanna um, go ahead and introduce Fernando Sequeira, and he is the Coastal Risk and Resilience Lead for Mexico at the Nature Conservancy, and we're really looking forward to your presentation today, Fernando. So I'm just gonna switch it over to you and you can take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good night to everybody who is in the, in the seminar, in the webinar. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present in our experience here in Mexican Caribbean that we have been developing um, by TNC and many partners that I will show you. So uh, again, thanks for the opportunity. So I'm going to explain uh, how we are working uh, in a process of the ensure natural and natural assets, uh, in this case, the reef in the Mexican American Reef. Come on. Yeah. So I, I'm speaking on behalf of many, many people who have been working in this process uh, from the science perspective, economic perspective, and the legal aspects of, of the process. So I would like to thank you, all the partners and members of colleagues of TNC who have been working here. But, but also, this is an effort that was, has been done with many organizations. Uh, we, as you will see, there is a big array of ex experiences and expertises that are needed to develop this process uh, for the science, coastal engineers, economics, uh, reef ecology, uh, lawyers, finance, and, and so we, we work together with so many people here, and obviously particularly with the government, uh, the Quintana Roo government and the National Commission of Protected Areas. I would like to highlight their participation uh, here. And, and so here we are in the Mesoamerican Reef, and particularly in the, in the Mexican Caribbean section with uh, Cancun, Puerto Morelos, uh, Tulum, which are the famous uh, tourist locations, are, are placed. And this is a project that began four years ago to reduce risk to coastal communities and to the infrastructure because this is a very well, it actually is the most important tourism destination in Mexico. It attracts 10 million uh, tourists per year, $10 billion, 100,000 rooms, but it's also highly exposed to, to hurricanes, uh, as, we, as we know, no, in the Caribbean. And it's a low-lying area. So high capital, very exposed, and an immense natural system that protects the, the, the area. That's why we chose um, the Mexican Caribbean as a pilot site for our project. So I will dip uh, into the, um, how do we develop this insurance, or are developing this insurance for the reef? So I will go through different process, through a process that now is organized, at the beginning was not as organized as I'm going to present today, uh, because we have been learning through these uh, three years or four years that I mentioned. And so now, in order to help you to understand the process and to replicate that in any other places, I will go uh, through these steps. So the first step is you need to assess if the asset 
It, it can be, this can be, this concept, that's what I want to emphasize, can be used to mangroves, wetlands, forests, uh, or any other natural assets. Uh, and we are calling asset because that's the, the, the terminology that we use in finance and, and with the insurance uh, uh, world, no? So it's an ecosystem, but actually. So first you need to ask yourself, do we need an insurance? Uh, it's worth an insurance for these assets. And I will tell you how to do that. Then identify the potential buyers of the insurance. Uh, then design the insurance. Uh, then you have a case to, to have an insurance. Then what is going to be the institutional arrangement to make the transaction? Then do the transaction, actually buy the insurance is another step. And finally, you need to have the capacities to repair the, the assets. Well, in this case, the, the reef, because yeah, you can have the money, but you also need the know-how of how to use those funds that insurance is going to provide you. So we're going to go through these steps and I'm going to explain you how we did it here in Mexico. So first step, assessing the asset needs insurance. So the first uh, thing to ask you is, uh, does this, do this asset, this natural system provides a valuable service? And you have to quantify that particularly in economic terms, because we can say many things, but we need to have economic value to actually follow the, the, the sequence of the process to convince a potential buyer or whatever. No? Second, you need to understand the, the risk that the asset has. Uh, and here we have many um, questioning because hurricanes is a natural uh, uh, phenomena that affect risk, uh, sorry, that affect the, the risk. So why you will need that uh, uh, an insurance against hurricanes, which is natural. So this is very important. Um, in this case, obviously, I will show you how we find out these uh, answers to these questions. Then, if the risk is insurable, um, a, a risk has to be uh, has statistical uh, information for the insurers to actually provide you with an insurance. So the risk models are the ones who know if a fire or a pollution or a uh, accident. Uh, or in this case, the hurricanes, which was very obvious because there are many insurance for hurricanes, but you can just do the risk, other risks. Uh, the asset can be repaired. Okay, you will have an insurance, you will have the money, but then you need to know if you can do something about it. You, you can use the money for something uh, tangible. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. So how we did it in the Mesoamerican Reef? First, we uh, evaluated the value of the coastal protection that the coral reef provide to the, to the coast, in this case, the infrastructure of the built capital. Uh, so there was a very sophisticated modeling uh, done by, as I mentioned, several partners. And we find out that one loss of, uh, of uh, one meter of the reef crest height will dramatically increase the damages to the, to the coastal areas. Generally, uh, you will see here in the storms that are, uh, with a return period of 10 to 25 years, the increase is 300%, uh, 400% uh, if we lose one meter. The, the stronger the storm, the less effective it is in, in proportionally, which actually provides still a very good protection. That was our main, the, the main uh, service in terms of uh, value of money, uh, protection against hurricanes and the storm surge. But another important service that provides that the hotel owners and the coastal people see every day is a beach protection. Beaches are being eroded and the reefs are also very important to protect uh, or reduce at least beach erosion. So uh, we also have these calculations of how much uh, wave energy is reduced every day uh, in normal conditions uh, by, the, by the reef. Um, because the hotel owners see the, the hurricane as a yeah, eventual, uh, event, but beach erosion is happening every day. So for them, the, the, the protection service provided to the beaches is more important, more tangible than the protection from the hurricanes. They know both, but this is what's uh, more important. So we also calculated that uh, here. Then, so we asked, uh, so uh, is uh, really the hurricanes causing a, a, a damage to the reef? So, and because there are a lot of degradation in, in the area, we have lost 80% of the, of the coral, light coral in the Mexican Caribbean, similar to other places in the Caribbean and in the world. Uh, but why hurricanes are, are particularly special here? So we find out that uh, statistically in the Caribbean, 17% uh, of the light coral cover is lost after 
after a hurricane. Uh, if we, we consider bleaching events, we consider water pollution, the process of losing coral cover is slowlier, but the hurricane is a big event, and in, obviously in a very short period of time, it destroys a lot. A lot. And we find that also, uh, I mean, not we, but actually the researchers, that um, they don't recover. I mean, the statistics have shown that today, for the last uh, 20, 30 years, there has not been real recovery from hurricanes because the, the conditions of the reefs are not so good as it used to be. No? So, so really the hurricanes uh, actually increase the rate of uh, loss of light coral cover. No? So people, uh, sites that have not been impacted by hurricanes have a loss of 2% per year, but uh, sites impacted by hurricanes have a loss of uh, up to 7% per year. So this is dramatic. So hurricanes actually do cause a very important uh, damage to reef. And then, uh, again, you also need to work on water pollution or bleaching events or other, other uh, impacts to the reef, but hurricanes are particularly important among all those threats that the reefs have. Then the question, can we do something about it? Can we do something to, re to reduce the, the, the damages to the reef after a hurricane? Uh, so yes, I mean you can go and clean the the reef, the debris, the broken corals. You can consolidate them, and actually can can help them. You will have a lot of fragments uh, in after a hurricane that you can just uh, collect, uh, help them to 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 grow again and and plant them again. And so the, the, there is a lot of techniques that have been proven not also in Mexico, but also there is a lot of experiences here and other places. Um, and also some structural uh, restoration. If the damage is too big, that will affect the protect, protective capacity of the reef, we can also do something about it. And we have experience of that. So the answer, can we do something with that money if we have an insurance? Yes, there, is, there are techniques and there are ways to do that. So we, we are safe. We, we move to the first step saying, yeah, we have a, an asset that can be and should be insured. Then, do we have a potential buyer? So we, we, you have to identify who is the party responsible for the asset. I mean, who is the entity, the government, or a private company, or whatever, who owns or responsible for the for the asset, or receives the benefits of the of the asset. You know. Then you need to understand if they are interested in maintaining the service and repairing the damage. They, they want to do something about it, or they can say, "Oh, well, it's damaged. Sorry, too bad." <laughs> and sometimes that happens. Um, and finally, the, the, this entity or party needs to transfer the cost of repairs because it's, it will be too expensive to actually address that, or at least it's reasonable to transfer the cost or the risk. And particularly important, they have the capacity to pay a premium. And there are some funding available or willingness to pay for, for that. So what we did here is, yeah, this is Puerto Morelos area, uh, south of Cancun, where we uh, began our project. And the National Commission of Protected area, area is the is a national park, so it's responsible for the for the park for the reef. So um, they were interested in doing something uh, for the next hurricanes. The hotels, which actually the beneficiaries of the coastal protection services, and, and for the beaches. And the state government, who is interested in re reducing the damages to the economy. Every time that hurricane hits the area, everything is disrupted. I mean, jobs are lost. And so these three parties were interested in saying, yes, we want to protect the reef, and it makes sense to have an insurance uh, to be to transfer the risk. Um, so then you have some people interested, you have an asset, and so let's go to design the insurance. So first question is, what type of insurance? Um, there are two types of insurance, the compensatory, which is the, generally the ones we know, medical insurance, uh, car, car insurance, where you actually receive a compensation based on the damages or losses you, you have, uh, or, the, or the expenses, for example, you, have a, you go to the doctor and they will pay you the surgery and so forth, no? uh, or an ac car accident. But that, that takes time. You have to measure the damages. You have to understand the cost of the repair. And it will, it's subject to litigation. I mean, particularly after hurricanes, the hotels have taken so much time in litigating the, the damages from the insurance companies. So there is another way, which is the parametric insurance, uh, which is a pre-agreed amount of money 
that is paid, no question asked, only if certain conditions are met. In this case, if you have a hurricane hitting your area, I will pay you no matter what. Maybe the reef is not damaged, maybe it's very damaged. I, I, don't, I will not ask questions. I will just pay you the amount of money we agree uh, on that. Uh, so it's designed for quick payment and allows, and allows particularly a quick response because the reef will need activities, I mean, two days after the hurricane. You have to go immediately to go and attend the reef uh, and, and clean the debris and read, avoid further damages to the reef. So parametric insurance was obvious the, the response to this question of what type of insurance you want. <coughs> so talking about what are the elements of a parametric insurance? Uh, the first one is you need a parameter, that's why the, the name, and a threshold, I mean, a value of the parameter. And so we need to develop this relationship between the characteristics of the event, in this case, a hurricane. For example, you can have bat bathymetric pressure, bat barometric pressure, per uh, sorry, uh, wind speed, uh, storm surge, uh, all the characteristics of the hurricanes, a time that is actually spending in, in, the, in the area. And so, there are, you have to choose one of them, one or two, can be more sophisticated if you want to use two parameters and a threshold. Let's say wind speed, at what, at what uh, wind speed do I need to, to, to trigger, in this case, the payment that I just mentioned. Second element is the polygon. So I, I need, even I have an asset, uh, I need to define the area, a specific, very specific area where a hurricane can pass through and and trigger again the, the payout of the insurance. And then the amount, how much money do you want? So in this time, we have to ask the question, how much money do I need to repair the reef? And so generally you will have different scenarios of damages. The same hurricane can have different levels of damages depending on the direction, depending on the condition of the reef. So this is actually a scenario building, which is what we did here. I mean, uh, to understand how much money do we need to ask for an insurance. So how we did that here? So we find out uh, we use uh, most of the scientific information we have is about uh, hurricane uh, wind speed. Uh, in this case, which is the graph we have here uh, and the impact on the light coral cover. Um, so that, that's, it, that's a very clear correlation between the wind speed and the damages to the reef. So between 50 and 100 more or less uh, knots, uh, the light coral cover actually sometimes is, is increasing after the hurricane, it decreases sometimes after the hurricane, but it's not a real trend of damages to the reef. Sometimes the smaller hurricanes actually uh, help uh, to clean the water, clean the algae, and so, this is more or less equivalent to categories one to three uh, hurricanes that actually don't damage statistically. Maybe one hurricane can really damage your reef, but for, for here, for the design of the insurance, you need a statistic information that actually can be applied to, to many sites. So this is the case. But, um, but then when we see a higher, uh, stronger speed, it's definitely, uh, we can see the decline in the light coral cover. Uh, up to 60% of loss in light coral cover uh, the year after the, the hurricane. So it, it's actually very um, obvious, I would say, in, in the graph uh, from this research researcher that beyond or above 100 knots, uh, the light coral cover uh, decreases dramatically. No? So then, so we, we chose, this is the, 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 this is the three, the parameter will be a wind speed, and the threshold is going to be 100 uh, knots um, uh, because we have seen be beyond that point, the damages to the reef increases. Then we were asking about the polygon. Um, how far the, the hurricane can pass by and affect your reef? I mean, it can be 30 miles, 50 miles, uh, 10 miles. And so there is no real at least so far, uh, statistics or data about it. So we have to do some interviews with people uh, to, re to remember uh, the past hurricanes that have gone through the area and ask them uh, how much damage uh, each hurricane has caused here. And so we have a, we, we still don't have a, a fixed polygon uh, yet. That's something to be discussed uh, in the negotiation as I'm going to mention. 
but you need that, that box. I mean, if a hurricane passes through that box, then with a, the, the wind speed max uh, above 100 knots, then the, the insurance will be triggered. Next step, uh, how much money do we need? So we developed these different scenarios um, um, with different kind of responses. The first is the, the first response. After the hurricane, you need to go and, and clean. To first clean, assess the damages, uh, as I mentioned, collect the debris, uh, collect the fragments, and do something. So that's, despite of the intensity of the storm, you will need to do something about it. Second step is you do some ecological restoration. Maybe the first scenario we say, well, maybe the, the reef was not severely damaged. We just need to clean it and don't do anything after that. But uh, scenario two and three, yeah, we increase the amount of ecological restoration we wanted to do. Um, and finally, if uh, for the scenarios three and four, is that, yeah, there was a severe uh, or catastrophic damage to the reef. So you will need some structural restoration. Yeah, we need to build some structure uh, because the damage were so bad. So again, limited restoration or structural restoration uh, normally. So we have a, a, a sophisticated uh, table with a number of divers, number of boats, number of uh, days you have to do the cleaning, uh, the cost of the structures. Uh, you have to do that in 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, uh, one kilometer. And so we're consulting the prices for all sets, but then the amount of the or the extent of the effort uh, is based on the scenarios because this is something that generally has not been done after a UEK. So, and again, uh, I was uh, restate that there are scenarios of uh, damage and the scenarios of intervention. How much would you like to, to intervene? So we cost them out. Uh, we came with these numbers. Uh, so maybe the, the, the first cleaning and the first activities uh, the range of the cost will be 100 uh, between fifty thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars in this uh, 28 kilometers stretch of the puerto Morelos national park we want to do some ecological restoration then yeah obviously it can go higher up to two million dollars and in the worst case scenario uh, and, the, and the most ambitious intervention we can uh, use eight million dollars for that so this is the estimated cost by a scenario. This doesn't mean this is the, the price we're going to, or the amount of money we're going to ask the insurance company. This is for us to understand how much money do we need on the different levels of damage and on the different levels of intervention. And so we have the money, we, we have the data, and we know what uh, and how to use the money. No? And, so the next step is to create this damage score. What is the relationship between this cost of repair with the parameter of demand? And then uh, select, select a threshold where you want to transfer the... the. So this is, uh, as uh, the advisor for the insurance company say, well, this has not been done before. So maybe the, the core damage is not necessarily the best one, but you need to start with something. You, you, you can do, you propose that. So, so we propose that uh, in the scenarios, below 100 knots, uh, we will only do the cleaning, we will only do the, the very basic, uh, and we don't need, for $50,000, we don't need to buy an insurance. But if we go above 100 knots, and we have to spend $2 million, then yes, we need to, to transfer the risk. We will not have the money, the $2 million for the National Park to do something after the UAK. Or even more expensive scenarios of intervention, not $4 million or $8 million. So, so we, we decided that definitely to, to hold the risk, as they, as they call it in the insurance uh, environment, um, below, sorry, below 100 knots and transfer the risk above 100 knots, which is category 4 hurricane, because the expenses or the cost of repair will dramatically increase after that. We already saw in the other graphic that below 100 knots, the damages are not so catastrophic, or not severe, you, you just need to clean, but beyond 100 knots, you really need to do something here. And that's why we chose 100 knots as the threshold uh, for transferring the risk. Okay, so important, ne then you have the, the numbers and you have the, the, uh, the value, but you need to assess, okay, do I really need to buy an insurance? I, I think you really, 
always have to ask the same the, the question or what I can hold the risk. So you, we know the cost of the damages or the cost of the lost services. You know the cost of repair. And then you may also have an idea of the cost of the premium. And so what are the numbers we have here? We have an annual benefits of more or less $15 million. Uh, coming from the, if, if a hurricane will hit the area, uh, I will lose this revenue or I will have those uh, damages, for example. No? So $5 million in tourism revenue, the some calculations that we did for that, from the tourists that actually go to the reef. Uh, $3 million in direct damages to, to the infrastructure and $7 million in indirect losses, meaning jobs that are being lost because the hotels are closed and all the economy that is affected by the closure of the tourist attractions. So this is a, a calculation that the economics do, uh, economists do in terms of annual uh, benefits. The cost of repair will be depending on the level of intervention you can choose from 2 million, the minimum, up to 2, 8 million if you want to do really a, I would say, a roll Rolls reparation. You would really want to go for everything. And the cost of the premium is uh, more or less between 5 to 8% for this case uh, of the value of the, of the insurance. So now we tell the beneficiaries, you can, you can invest $100,000 at the minimum, that's the highly recommended uh, figure or even more, and you will save $15 million on damages. So it really makes sense. It really makes sense to transfer the risk because you will save a lot of money or or, or you invest $100,000 um, and, and you will need to pay $2 million uh, for the repair, which generally they don't do. I mean, generally they don't do repair. They just let the, the reef to be recovered by themselves, by, by itself. So these are the very important numbers to convince people, yes, it's a wise investment. It's, it's wise to transfer the risk. It doesn't cost that much if you compare with the damages you may, you may have if you don't do it. Uh, or the benefits, you actually you get the money and actually you can do some some real repair. Uh, so with that, we we convince we have convinced people of the benefits and the rationale of buying an insurance. Then next step is to define the institutional arrangement. How is going to be managed? This is a very complicated topic because the the laws are uh, define how the insurance are being bought, are being paid, and so forth. Importantly, you know, you have to combine all people who have been involved in the process, the responsible entity for the asset, in this case, CONAMP, the beneficiaries of the services, the hotel association, or the hotels that are actually being affected or not by the reef, and then the expert who knows how to repair the asset, because um, then identify and agree on who is going to buy. I mean, legally, you only one person can, only one entity can buy it, no? And there is, so you need to assess what is your legal framework in your country to identify that. Um, because not every, I cannot buy a, a, an insurance for you, I mean, or for anybody, for a third party. There has to be a relationship between the buyer and the, and the asset you want to protect. And then who receives the payout? It can be different entity. It can be because, if the money came in into what well, somebody's government, and that was there's a lot of mistrust here. Uh, how is going to be managed the money? You will receive the money. Is it going to be used really in the uh, decided intent? So it's very important to to clarify that, and then define the rules of how to manage that that money. Uh, how is going to be invested? Who is going to approve the projects and, and so forth? And you need to do in a very expedite way. So those are the, the steps in institutional arrangement. So how do we do it here in Mexico? We are developing a, a trust that is a, a, finally a public trust with private participation from the hotel owners and the scientific community to ensure that actually this trust is going to work on reef restoration. This is not only going to work for the insurance, it's a trust that is actually being set up for managing the coastal area, actually for funding projects in the coastal area. It has an advisory committee, a scientific committee, uh, because in the trust itself is mostly government institutions, um, tourism, public works, protected areas, and so forth. 
and the advisory committee will have scientific people, the reef ecologists, the coastal engineers, the oceanographers, uh, who actually know how to do the, the repair or the care of the, of the reef. So they will buy the parametric insurance and the threshold, as I mentioned, gonna be 100 knots or category four and five hurricanes. If there is no event that year, and then there will be a partial refund to the, to the buyers, in this case, the trust, and they can use the money for reef restoration. But if they have a, an event, but they will pay the trust and use the money for the reef restoration. So that's the scheme we're using here in Mexico. So make the transaction. So you have the entity, uh, and this is another step here. You need to develop the terms of coverage. All what I showed you before are the elements to develop these terms of coverage. How much money do you want? What is the polygon? Uh, what are the trigger? Who is going to buy it? Who is going to receive the money? So there are like 15 elements of the terms of coverage that need to be agreed among all the stakeholders in this institutional arrangement. Same, then, sorry, uh, find a willing seller. Yeah, there are, it's interesting because we have received many calls from different companies saying, hey, I've heard you are developing this uh, insurance. Uh, I would like to know when it's going to be ready because I would like to propose my, my product, no? Um, it has to be very open and, and then negotiate the terms. And you can have the, to receive the, the quotes and suddenly you will find out, oh, it's too expensive, or, it's, uh, or, or maybe I can pay more premium so I can have a, a, a improve my coverage. As you will do with any insurance, you still can negotiate uh, the terms of the, the final terms of the, of the transaction. And then very important, uh, and this is something that you will do along the process, not necessarily at the end, is to build the capacities to, to reduce the damages and repair the assets. So what we have, what have been working parallel to that, to this process on the last uh, two or three years is first develop a post-storm protocol. What are we going to do immediately after a storm? So we need to know what are the steps one, two, three, uh, and have the capacities in, in the forms of brigades that are going to go into the water after a UE came. And so we are building the capacity. We have a protocol already, uh, and we will begin building the, the training uh, sorry, the brigades, and uh, mostly volunteers who want to go on, uh, into the water and, and protect the reef. Then how to repair the, the reef after the hurricane. And so 30, 40 days after the hurricane, then you need to you assess the damages and you need to, to do some ecological or structural restoration. So we also develop, uh, develop a reef repair guide. And, and again, train people in doing that because there are new techniques uh, you will get, yeah, Luckily, a lot of funding, and you will need to know you you need to have the capacity to do that. So, um, so revising the steps uh, as a summary uh, again is you need first to assess as if the asset needs an insurance, is worth having an insurance, identify the potential buyers, design the insurance, define institutional arrangements to make the uh, the transaction, make the transaction itself and build the capacities to repair the reef, in this case, or the asset. Yeah. Um, and again, well, thank you very much for all these people who have been working with us. And you have any questions, I'm really willing uh, to answer them or uh, and continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fernando. That was excellent. Uh, so just to remind everybody quickly, uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel, there is a little questions box. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in there. Uh, we'll spend the next uh, about 20 minutes or so doing Q&A. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that came in right now. Uh, one quick question for you, Fernando. Uh, do you already have a buyer for the insurance? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, we, we are developing the, the trust and it's pretty much uh, almost ready and, and established. Uh, they are, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, so about how long did this process take? We began three years ago. Um, but actually, I mean, next time we will do that, uh, I would say year and a half or, or one year to develop the... the, the, the the information for the 
insurance. The challenge here is, do we have the statistical information? We are right, right now we are doing version two of the insurance. Uh, we are going to hire new consultants to assess the damages to the reef and so forth. Uh, because now we know what are the gaps on information. So I would say you can take one year uh, to do the version one of the insurance, uh, as, as they call us quick and dirty, uh, and it's fine. I mean, that's the way insurance are being developed. You, you test and then you, but you can refine it uh, with time. Um, so we are, now we are just launching the, the second phase with more information and more uh, uh, filling the gaps of information we have. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of related questions here that I'm gonna try to paraphrase all together. Uh, who is part of the trust? Yeah, there will be the, the government of Quintana Roo who is setting up the trust uh, and different entities within the trust, like the tourism, the tourism ministry, the public works ministry, um, the obviously the environmental ministry, and then federal entities that actually are responsible for the coastal area. Um, and then also the, the hotel associations, the, by, in this case also TNC, um, the, in the advisory committee, we will have the scientific uh, community, like the universities um, who know the area and work in the area. So it will be it's a, it's a, it's a, in the technical committee or the board of the trust is mostly government institutions and in the advisory committee is mostly scientific uh, entities and people. No? Excellent, thank you. Uh, so do you have, uh, I guess, ways that you prevent uh, free riding on this whole thing? Like for people that aren't a party to the trust but would still benefit from it, do you have any suggestions for dealing with that situation? Uh, you will have it. I mean, in particularly when you, you are uh, working on uh, large areas, I mean, you cannot just protect your small reef in front of your hotel, for example, which was some of the original ideas, or so you have to... To, to have an impact, you need to, to have the, the system. I mean, in this case, the National the Park of Puerto Morelos is a, as an example of even the government wants to, to, wants to expand that from all the way to Cancun to Tulum. So like 150 kilometers of the area being protected. Um, depending on the money, how the money is coming from, is if it's, a, it's in a form of tax, but nobody can avoid paying taxes. And so we go through that. If a voluntary contribution, yeah, you, you risk to have um, free riders. Um, so I would say you will have free riders. That's uh, no way to go about it. But at least uh, that's why you need the economic numbers as a society or as a group or as an uh, entity. You can live with that. You, you, you can manage those free riders because the benefits are more than the losses caused by these free riders. Thank you. Uh, so has anything of this scale in terms of reef restoration been tested before? I don't think at this scale. I mean, we have been working and now we have a network of reef restoration in, in people or institutions in the Mesoamerican Reef and, you know, and the efforts have been just very focalized in some sites. So nothing at this extent. And um, yeah, this will be a challenge to, to increase the capacity and to increase the extent of the restoration after a UDK. Wow, that is impressive. Uh, all the more reason to follow the developments of this in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question here uh, going back to step six of this, uh, build the capacities to repair the reef. Uh, are there incentives to lower the premium, i.e. like uh, maintaining or improving coral conditions before there are hurricanes? Mm, actually, no. Maybe what you can think is that if my reef is healthier, then I don't need to buy such a, an expensive, let's say, uh, insurance or uh, the payout can be lower. I mean, I can decide not to buy a $8 million payout, but maybe only $2 million and so forth, no? So it will be more like a decision of the buyer saying, saying that I can reduce that. But given that it's a parametric insurance, it's not related to the condition of the reef, it's more related to the, to the risk itself. I mean, what are the possibilities of having a hurricane 4 passing through this area, no? So you, you can improve 
the health of the reef, but that will not affect the, the amount you pay. But you can decide, okay, I'm gonna reduce my, my payout. I'm gonna um, buy a smaller insurance. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so we had a the interesting oh, thing that we found in the statistics is that the better the reef you have, it will also be damaged. I mean, a reef with a, maybe, a, I remember the data, like let's say 30, 40% of like coral cover are more prone to damage because they have more to lose. I mean, if the reef is in a better condition, I would say they have more to lose. If a, if a reef is already damaged, is degraded, yeah, there's not much to lose. And, and then, um, yeah, that's a, a complication because if your reef is dead, you will not lose anything. <laughs> so that's the reason for that. So that's an interesting situation. Yeah. Uh, so I believe the answer to this question is no, but we had a, a couple of people asking, uh, has any insurance scheme like this been done before? As far as we understand for natural assets, no. They have sold a parametric insurance. That's a, I would say, a standard product in the market um, to protect. Uh, so from the insurance point of view, the, the, the concept itself is, is there. For the buyer point of view, to buy something to protect a natural asset, as far as, I, as we know, it hasn't been done. I mean, they protect highways and buildings, schools, and so forth but not for the reef or financial assets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so we had a question here about, uh, I guess earlier in the webinar, you mentioned partial refunds. Could you talk more about that and how that factors into insurers' conditions or considerations? Yeah, that's an, an interesting uh, approach because um, if you don't have a, that's something that the companies, uh, the advisors told us that if you, in one year, you don't have an event, you could be entitled and you can negotiate that with the with the seller uh, okay this year i don't have a i pay you hundred thousand dollars for my premium so sorry for my policy and i can receive let's say ten thousand dollars back if there is no event during the year but if i have an event well i will receive the eight million dollars or the two million dollars depending on the payout so that, that, that's a that's an uh, an incentive for the for the buyer to say okay if you don't have a risk if you don't have a, an event you will receive a, a discount but the discount will only come at the end of the year if you don't use my insurance. Um, yeah, so this is a discount um, depending of not having an event. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, so have similar approaches been developed for risks to reef associated with uh, coastal land use, like sediment, uh, pollution, things like that? The, the problem with other risks, like the water pollution, for example, is it's not a, an insurable risk. Uh, you can only insure a risk uh, that has a statistical data. For example, I mean, let's say, yeah, uh, maybe an accident for a, for a boat or, or like a oil spill or these kind of things. But water pollution that is coming, like, uh, I mean, regularly, you cannot insure. You, you can insure yourself from an accident and then, yeah, you, you have to define. For example, if there is a, I don't know, um, I cannot see here in Mexico, but yeah, like in Gulf of, Cali, Gulf of Mexico, where you have all these oil operations and you, you can insure yourself. So that, that could be that over there would make sense to, to buy insurance against oil spills. Uh, but in that case, the company who, who has the operation has to have the insurance. So you don't need to do that. Um, so the, the, in the, maybe if I understood the question is the risk has to be insurable and it has to be in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a couple of related questions here that I'll just do one after the other. Uh, so in terms of engaging with the local stakeholders in this process, uh, did you receive any pushback from uh, the different in industries you were trying to get insurance from? From the sellers? You mean from the insurance companies? Yeah. You mean pushback? You mean the complaints, or I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think I think the the question asker is trying to get to like you know were there I, I guess like insurance companies that were just kind of like you know why are you trying to do this kind of thing? Like, did it require um, more of a, a sell on your point to make this something that an insurance company would want to want to insure? 
Yeah, at least for the insurance companies, they are very keen on, on doing business. I mean, this is an, a new business opportunity, so they are really um, interested in, in selling a, a product. From the buyer's point of view, or at least from the institutions in charge of the reef or the beaches, so, yeah, the would question, why we need an insurance? Why just don't wait for the event to happen and I put my money to repair the reef uh, or to repair the beach or whatever, I mean, like, like we just normally do. We don't take an insurance. We just bear the risk and pay the expenses when it comes. Um, so we have more opposition or more questioning about why I want to, to spend every year $100,000 or more for something that may not happen. Like we all do when we buy an insurance. Should I buy an insurance? Why I don't save that money? And even I put it in a savings account or I go and do something with that money. So. That's why making the case of how much you will lose if you don't have an insurance is very important. And so we have more more challenges with the buyer's side than with the seller's side. Do you have any information online, uh, you know, kind of about that engagement process and about how you uh, were able to, you know, change the minds of businesses and like get them to buy into the insurance? Well, actually, not yet. We are developing a case study for that that is going to be released soon uh, and a guidance of how to do. For example, this presentation is based on, on this guidance of uh, how to repeat that. We are going to start working on, on replication. We are going to start working on replication of this effort uh, in the Mesoamerican Reef. We have an agreement with the MARF Fund uh, to work in Belize and Honduras and also Mexico and other areas for the replication. So it will be uh, there soon. Um, the version two and the replication efforts because there's, there has been a lot of interest in, in this kind of a scheme. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we certainly heard a lot of interest from our network, so I, I'd be really interested in, in sharing those once they're available. Um, we also had a question here. Are there any tax incentives for businesses to participate? I will not call it tax incentive. It's a tax, I mean, uh, that the, the hotels have to pay we, at the beginning, we were looking for a voluntary contribution of the hotels uh, for the to, to buy the insurance, but they are already paying taxes, and they said, "Well, I don't want to increase my contributions. I just want the taxes that I'm being I'm paying be used in that pur with, with that purpose." Um, so, it's a, there will not be tax incentive; it's just the taxes that are, are paying. And in particular, the, the idea of the trust is that we'll give transparency in the use of the funding because the trust, part of the, one of the benefits of that is the, yeah, the clarity of the accounts and you, you can access the, how the money is being spent and be part of the decision. So that was the incentive. Say, okay, I'm paying my taxes. I want to be sure now that the money that I'm using is being spent wisely no? through the trust. Yeah. Uh, so a question here about uh, the restoration aspects. Uh, so what happens to premiums if the quality of the ecological state of the reef after uh, the reef has been damaged from a hurricane and you've restored it is less than what it started with? Well, it's not related to the insurance because the insurance will pay you the amount of money. And even, I would say, you can even have received the money and do nothing with that. I mean, you can use it to build your house <laughs> and that's the risk because there is no i paid you the the, the payouts i mean as an insurance company and so it doesn't matter what happened after that is is the trust that has to guarantee that the money they receive is invested in the restoration of the reef and maybe with let's say with two two million dollars uh, after the hurricane i do all the repair i can with two million dollars and i don't reach the level of uh, restoration i had before or the quality, you said the quality of the reef before the hurricane. Well, too bad. I didn't uh, have an insurance with enough money uh, to do the repair. Or maybe there are other reasons why you didn't reach that. So when you buy the insurance, you know I will have this amount of money. Let it just uh, say uh, hypothetically $2 million. And I hope with that money I will have enough to put my reef back to the original condition. But if the damages are too, too high, maybe I will not get there, but at least I will do a big push, I will say, in terms of helping my reef. So, um, or maybe I can just go and buy a, a more expensive 
and higher payout insurance for a million dollars and just to make sure. If I got the money, I can do that. But generally, I what I've seen is that people really want to reduce the amount of the cost of the payout. Sorry, sorry, the cost of the premium to the minimum. And so that's the discussion. That's a very good question because is the money going to be enough to put the reef back to the condition you had before the before the the hurricane? Mm -hmm. So related to premiums, uh, do you expect the cost of your premiums to be impacted by climate change, like with more higher intensity hurricanes happening? In the long term, yes. I mean, right now, I think the, the, the insurance companies and all the risk modelers that they are supporting them, they are really having to consideration uh, these factors. They, they really have, uh, I mean, it's amazing the science. The, we are far behind from the insurance company in terms of uh, modeling the risk from climate change. So if that factor, I would bet, is already included in the price today. But maybe, yeah, within 40, 50 years, the, the payout, so, sorry, the cost of the premium will be higher. But for today and tomorrow or the next uh, three, four years, I don't see that an increase because they have already included that risk in the models. And they are very sophisticated, really sophisticated. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so can you talk more about uh, the refund to the trust and like, you know, how the trust or like how the trust is organized, kind of like how they decide what to do with the money? Yeah, uh, here we have to follow some of the rules that uh, the laws in this case of the, of the state of Quintana Roo and the Mexican law and uh, how to set up trust in, in this case. So there is a board, it's called technical committee with these entities. And they are the ones who have to develop a work plan for the year. And, and they have to develop um, I mean, how they're going to spend the money. No? So the, the buying the policy will be one of the activities uh, that they will um, fund. Um, so in the case of an event or and that they receive the money from, from, from the payout for the insurance, a uh, similar situation. So the advisory committee that I show you there, which is a, that's an, an optional entity uh, body that we included in the trust to make sure that all the projects that are being proposed are actually revised by this advisory body and, and approved. So we have this, as I mentioned before, the protocol and the guidelines. Um, so we expect them to be part of the bylaws of the trust to say, okay, if you're going to do some cleaning uh, of the reef and you're going to fund some of those projects, this is the protocol you need to follow. So you, you just cannot do whatever. So again, maybe in terms of the governance, we have the technical committee as the general board, we have the advisory committee, and then we have the bylaws that will include the protocol and the guidance. Um, the idea is that the projects that are being funded by the trust need to be approved, or at least have the, maybe approved is a, legal is not the correct word, but has to have the uh, okay. <laughs> from the advisory committee uh, to, to move on. Okay. Uh, so we had a couple questions here asking what the specific role of Swiss Re is and if they're the sole underwriter. Yeah, at the beginning, uh, I mean, you know, TNC and Swiss Re have, have a good relationship for many years and they were advising us in the process when we began. Uh, so, for example, what information do I need to collect to design insurance? I mean. So they were a close advisor, so and find how much do you need, the payout, the trigger. And so they, they were asking us and assisting us in, in asking the, the right questions. And we have to go directly and, and find the information to answer those questions. Um, but, but now in the terms of the transaction itself, they will be one of the many companies that can uh, present their quotes uh, for the product. Uh, it's very important for the Mexican government, you know, under all these conditions, to have a very transparent procurement process uh, to buy the um, insurance. Uh, so it has to be an open bid, um, an insurance company. But this is an interesting thing. I mean, uh, Swiss Re is a reinsurance company, and they cannot sell directly insurance. Uh, an insurance company in each country is the one who is uh, legally uh, able to sell uh, a product. And so we have to buy uh, the insurance from, a, let's say, a Mexican or at least Mexican registered company. 
and they can they can uh, reinsure their the policy with the big ones, yeah, Munich Re, London Re, Munich Re, Swiss Re, and others, no? So they were very helpful with us in, in designing the, the insurance, and, but in the terms of the transaction, it will be an open bid, and they are one of the many who will propose, obviously they are very keen, they are very eager to, to present a quote. They are very good in these businesses. Um, and so, yeah, we're keep working with them. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so it looks like we have time for about one more question here. Uh, so I guess to end this whole thing, then, as far as questions goes, uh, have you considered a tax levy to tourists that could directly fund insurance and reef restoration? Well, um, the, um, the government of Quintana Roo has considered how to increase the funding uh, for the coastal zone management. And I would say not particularly to the insurance, but actually that is, as you said, need to do more on reef restoration. I mean, and in this case, it's despite of a hurricane because the reef are degraded. We need to restore them anyway. So we need to start tomorrow <laughs> or even yesterday. So yes, there has been talks about uh, how to increase the funding for coastal management, uh, like a, yeah, a tax for the tourism or increase in the, in the uh, uh, how do you call the hotel tax, let's say. Well, obviously, as long as you have lack of transparency in the process, the industry will be reluctant to pay more. I mean, and that's what was is very important to guarantee transparency of what you are doing, so the private sector is willing to pay more because they know that that what they are paying is going to be used properly. No, so mm -hmm. I, I I think that the most important um, bottleneck in increasing taxes, uh, like the one you mentioned is uh, trust and that's why this again trust fund <laughs> is a very important instrument to regain the trust quintana roo and other states in mexico and many places in latin america have a uh, lack of trust by the public because corruption sounds like america <laughs> <laughs> well yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway, with that, <laughs> thank you so much for presenting this webinar for us, Fernando. And thank you, Sherry, for presenting about the Reef Resilience Network at the beginning. Uh, just for everybody to note, uh, you can go to reefresilience.org for more information um, about the Reef Resilience Network and to follow their newsletter and webinars. Um, and from all of us at Octo, I thank you very much for taking the time to join us for this webinar. Uh, be sure to follow us at Open Octo on Twitter for more uh, webinar announcements. And um, I think that is all from us. So anyway, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we'll have this webinar recorded, uh, or we have been recording this webinar, and we'll have it archived on openchannels.org in about an hour. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Take care.